Alright, it's, it's recording. Uh, we would like to say uh, Josiah Strickland, uh, he's been here for the last month or so. Uh, we've enjoyed having you here. He's going back to Atlanta this week. Uh, that's where his home is, but he's promised that he will come back and visit us often. You'll be in our prayers, bro. Thank you for joining with us and being yes. with us the last month or so. And uh, so thank you for that. And we go, we got Keith with us this morning. Brand new person. Uh, Keith usually is doing security. I appreciate him being here. But in the first book of Peter, first book of Peter, uh, chapter one, and there's one eyed Peter and two eyed Peter. We're, we're one eyed Peter this morning. First Peter, chapter one. <clears throat> Thanks again for all of the, those of you that come into this class every week. I, I, I know it would be easy just to come an hour later and watch it a little bit later on uh, Facebook, but I appreciate you coming in here and listening to me on Sunday morning, those of you that are here. Uh, I also appreciate those online that uh, come on. Some of them use it as a devotion, and I'm okay with that. They use it as a devotion. Uh, they would, one of their mornings, they'll pull up that thing and and uh, you know look at it, and that's their devotion for the morning. They get it out, and that's their devotion. That's that's okay too. I, I don't care how you use it, as long as you don't use it for false advertising or fake news. <laughs> but I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Uh, but I, I appreciate those of you that uh, are here with us and uh, on online as well. Um, I, I really believe that church is important. I'll just put in a quick announcement before we start. I, I, I honestly believe church is important. When you look at how all of the schools nationwide are doing without having students in the schools, it's a, absolutely a disaster. I mean, it's a disaster. Our kids are dumbing down. I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, it's going to be terrible in a few years if we don't get this mess straightened out. And I'm not going to get in politics this morning. I'm just saying, church is important, guys. Church is important. I, I came here, and like some of you came here, you were here when we were doing online church, and and and, and nothing wrong with that. The praise team was here and stuff like that. I listened to the sermons there, but there's something about it. Like two weeks ago, when the Lord was moving, and we felt the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost was moving, there was something about being in this place under the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit and, and, and being able to feel His presence. When I walked away from this place, Suzanne, I felt like I'd been to church. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just something about being here. So I'm, I'm going to give a plug for church. I, I, I believe it, whether it's Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever time it is, I, I know now why after this pandemic, God said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together in the house of God. Why did he say that? Because he figured we were going to doom down if we, if we didn't come to church. Uh, because, uh, you know, you can have your devotions and God is there and God's been with me in my devotions. But there's something special about coming to God's house and feeling God's presence and being with God's people and fellowship and things of like that. So thank you again. No, that's that's my advertisement. I wasn't uh, advertising any product or anything. Yeah, I was too. I was advertising the church. Y'all come to church. Invite somebody to come to church. We're still social distancing. This lesson today, I, I don't know if I'll finish it today, but I, I just want to, if anything, I want to flood your heart, your hearts with hope today. I want to flood your hearts with hope today. There's a lot of things in this life that are overrated. Uh, sometimes I'll go to a movie or something, and man, the 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 uh, not the, not the thriller, the trailer. <laughs> the the trailer looks awesome. I've I've seen trailers on TV. I said, man, I can't wait till that movie comes out. And I go to the movies, watch the movie, and uh, man, that that weren't all it was cracked up to be. Uh, you know, vacations can be overrated. I mean, you see those pictures on, on, on the internet and stuff like that, and you see all the green water and stuff like that. It was kind of like that with Puerto Rico. I mean, we went to Puerto Rico one time to see my cousin. He was at BD there, and he was an executive, so we stayed at his house on Puerto Rico. And as we traveled around Puerto Rico, 
Uh, it was amazing. I saw all these beautiful pictures on the internet and stuff. When you got to Puerto Rico, the beaches were absolutely nasty. There was seaweed everywhere. I said, hey, you know, this is not what I saw on the internet. It was, it was kind of disappointing after we saw what it was and, and the way it is. <clears throat> and, you know, teams can be overrated. Teams can be overrated. Uh, you know, I, I, and, and be honest with you, I, I care less if Carolina wins or not, but Carolina at the first of the year was really highly rated. And it's really been kind of disappointing to me because I, I figured, who's our quarterback, Sam? No, what's not Sam Howe. Uh, you know, Sam Howe's a great quarterback. I think he'll go to the next level. But, you know, they've been disappointing in some of their things. They, they were expected to be, and they got up pretty high, but they were expected to be, you know, top four or five team. But anyway, all, all college football, sports, everything is overrated now with the COVID virus. But it, it is, things are overrated. I'll tell you another thing that to me is the most overrated thing that you can think of. That's hair. Hair is overrated. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, hair is overrated. David, tell them, but hair, hair is overrated. <laughs> hair is overrated. So, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I've, 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 I've had hair and don't have it now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's overrated. But a lot of things are, you know, when, when you get to a point in place to where you're burnt out, you're stressed out, Nothing's going your way. You're facing unemployment, maybe addiction or loneliness or death of a loved one like you know, the Worthington family is today. Well, you need something to get you through that. And this, this letter today that Peter was writing to the church was being written to a church that was facing severe persecution. I'm not talking about masks. I'm not talking about social distancing or being quarantined for 10 days. These people could be killed at any time that, that Paul was writing to. They were living their faith every day. When they went out in the morning, they didn't know, Ricky, if they would return that afternoon. They didn't know if some of their family would be stopped in the market. And because they were associated with a Christian, that they would be, they, they would be able to return that day, that they would be killed. They thought they would do that. And to, to say that they were living in uncertain times is really an understatement. It's really an understatement. We say we're living in uncertain times, but we face nothing like they have faced. Now, we, we may face that in the next coming years, but, but these people were facing some very tough times. And, you know, it's, it's been true for us in the last eight months as well because we, we realize that it shows us how quickly life can change. If you would have told me eight months or nine months ago that this is the way that seemingly 2020 is going to end, I'd say you're crazy. I'd say you're crazy. Me and Paul were talking about the other day about, about the vacations and stuff. You know, we had no homecoming this year. We had no Easter this year. We had no Fourth of July this year. A lot of times we have a cantata or something like that. We'll have no Christmas this year. I mean, you know, it, look how much just in the church has changed. And Paul was telling me one day that somebody, uh, you know, uh, which R Ricky's bold now. Ricky's going to end up. Ricky's going to end up getting killed. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, R Ricky's going to end up getting killed. He put on Facebook uh, the, the, this week about he didn't care what the government said. He's going, but he's going, he's going to uh, celebrate with his family and stuff like that. But and he, he did justify that. He said he was going to. Uh, said he was going to you know, practice social distancing and all that kind of good stuff and things like that. And, uh, and, and I don't even know who the person was that responded, but she responded that she had not seen her mom or her family or something in one time since all this stuff with COVID. That's sad. Amen. That, that, that's sad. And, 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 and I'm not trying to stir up controversy on whether you should do it or not. I mean, I, I think it's up to an individual. But, but you know, these people that it shows us, it shows us how quickly life can change. And, and you see people that get COVID and, and young people and old people and, and, and COVID and, and, and they say, you know, a week later, you know, they're fine. A week later, they're on a ventilator and they're dead. 
And, 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 and if nothing else, it should show us, just like it did the early church, how that they lived with a passion. They lived with a purpose. Same thing pastors been telling us for months. They lived with a passion. Why? Because they knew that this was not their permanent home. They knew this was not their dwelling place. They knew that they were going to a better place. So they lived with a passion every day because they realized what we have just realized that in... Thank you for coming, Mr. Blackman. Thank you. Uh, they realized that, that with this, that any day things could be different. I really believe that those that early church that Peter was writing to, I believe when they left out in the morning, George, man, they kissed all the kids and then and then you hugged their wife and, and you know, all this and you know, a lot of times I'll be hurrying going to work. Going, hey baby, I'm going to work and I'll, I'll see you later. Okay, bye. And I run out of doors. So I think they took time to practice because they they did not know what was going to happen that day. They didn't know if they would be stopped that day or, or what it whatever it would be. And in and, and, and 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm just like to read three verses there. 1 Peter cha uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, I said 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Peter said, wrote to the church there, he says, All praise to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy. It's not by anything that we have accomplished. It's not by anything that we has made us... Um, 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 what's the word I'm trying to think? Uh, made us uh, deserving of of having this this great mercy. God God gave it to us. He just he, he out of His love for us, He gave us this great mercy, and and, and He gave us that we have been born again. You know, a lot of times we just take that for granted, granted being born again. We've been born again. It's not like we've given, been given a second chance. It's not like a do-over or a mulligan. And sometimes I play golf with guys and they want to say, okay, let's do a mulligan on 18. Or we'll do two, a mulligan on the front and the back, you know, playing teams or something like that. Uh, okay, there, there's no mulligans. There's no there's no second chances. There's nothing like that. God has God has let us be born again, a new birth, completely made over, that we might be able to have that hope. And he says, and because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. If you look at that in other translations, it now we live with this living hope. It's that living hope. We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until, until you receive this salvation. What, what, what is the salvation he's talking about? He's not talking about from sins there. This salvation that you will see the, the redeeming of that hope that Christ is laying up for you here. Is that, that, that salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day. So be truly glad, he said. Why does he want us to be glad? Because we have a living hope. We, we've got something to hope for far beyond what we see now. He says, so be truly glad. There is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. For a little while. He tells us that we as children of God are going to endure, endure trials for a little while. In his great mercy, he did all of these things. Compared to eternity, our life is just a short span. Hope appears 71 times in the New Testament. I believe that we can have a hope so strong that when dream intruders come into our lives and crash into our life, that God, we can know that God will be with us and, and that we can face death without fear. I'll be honest with you, it, it's gotten so it's gotten so easy for me the last eight or ten months to look at what's going on here now, and if we're not careful, that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. It makes you almost lose your focus of what we're working for. 
what we're, what we're going to. Donna, you think Lynn would come back here if she could? Think your mom would come back here if she could? There's no way. And, you know, my, my dad, and when I, I look out over here, and those of us that are lost, B Billy, you and Paul's mom wouldn't want to come back here with her arthritis and things that she faced. She, there's no way she would want to come back. She, she, you know, if, if, if anything, they, they realize that what they faced in the time that they faced it here was nothing compared to what they're experiencing at this moment. And, 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 and I, I saw a t-shirt that said this. A guy was wearing a t-shirt and it said this on there. It says, live like you will die tomorrow. Die knowing that you live forever. I like that. Live like you'll die tomorrow, but die like you like you live forever because you will. There, there was a person that uh, I knew that was having a, 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 a had a brain tumor, and uh, he was going to have surgery, and he was standing with some of his family, and he says, "Listen," he said, "I think I'm in a win-win situation." And he said, "What do you mean?" He says, "Either I'm going to wake up." When I wake up, I'm going to be back here with you guys, or I'm going to wake up in heaven. And, and you know, I, 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 I feel like I've got a win-win situation. David got so focused on this living hope that, you remember in Psalms where he wrote, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Surely, that word surely means no doubt. It's a done deal. Whatever happens, whatever disappointments, he said it's just a little while. It's just a little while. David realized, think about the things that David faced all of his life. All the things that he went through all of his life. And, and all of these, he said, surely goodness, Lord, I'm, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Most of you may remember or have heard about uh, a swimmer named Florence Chadwick. She was uh, one of the first women, I, I think if she wasn't the first, she was one of the first, to swim the English Channel. Uh, and, and it's 23 miles on the English Channel. But she was going to swim from Catalina Island uh, off the coast of California back to California. And she got into the water and she began to swim. And it was a kind of a chilly morning. And fog was really terrible that day when she was swimming from the island and stuff. And there was a lot of times she was being stung by stuff and the water was cold. And she, her mother was actually on the boat with her and said, and, you know, several times she said, just take me up by water. I can't go to the father. I just can't go to the father. And, and, and her mother kept saying, no, you, can, you can make it. You can make it. Keep on swimming. Keep on going. They're, you're going to make it. And finally, she, she got said, she just, I, I can't do it. She just stopped swimming and started to go under, and they pulled her up out of the water into the boat. And it was just shortly thereafter, she found out that she was 800 yards away from shore. 800 yards away from shore. The next day, they were doing an interview with, with, with the TV cameras and stuff like that, and they said, did, did, you, did you realize that you were only 800 yards away from shore? If you would have known that, do you think you could have made it? She said, all I could see was a fog. All I could see was a fog. If I could have seen the shore, I believe I could have made it. You know, that's where we are as Christians today. You know, with the pandemic and everything that's taking place and and what people, and as I look over this classroom this morning, that there are things that you have gone through that I don't know I could have made it through because we get so accustomed to looking at fog. The fog is heavy. And we say, Lord, is this never going to end? You know, I think about COVID and, and all of these things that they keep telling us, all these new things. I say, you know, God, you know, when is this going to change? But I'm reminded of what she said. If I could have just seen the shore. By faith today, we've got to look towards the shore. 
God never promised us that swim would be easy. God never promised the swim wouldn't be easy. He never promised that there wouldn't be times that we couldn't see our way clearly either. But it's by faith we keep looking for the shore. And we keep on swimming. We keep on swimming because we never know when we're going to face that time. In Romans 8, 18, it says, what we suffer now is not compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. This life is filled with tragedy and heartache and injustice, but this is just our temporary home. It's just our temporary home. Every day when these disciples in, in the book of 1 Peter got up every day, you know what was on their mind? It was always, it wasn't, I'll see you later. It was things like, I'll see you on the other side. They were focusing on heaven. They were not focusing on this earth. Why? Because it was, it was filled with persecution. They didn't know what the next moment would, would bring for them. They didn't know what, what would happen. You know, God looks at things such a different timetable than what we have. There was this guy one time, he says, he asked God, he said, God, is it true that a thousand years are like one second to you? And he says, yes. And he says, well, let me ask you another question. He says, is it true that like a million dollars is, is, is like a penny to you? And he says, that's true. And the guy says, God, I need to ask you a question. He said, would you mind if I would, could get one of your pennies? And he says, just a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all get that one. You get that one. It's thanks for doing it. Uh, just a second. The average life expectancy now in the United States is 78.06 years. Now, that's not... That's not factoring in for male and female. It's a little bit different. But the average for a human being. 78.06 years. Let's just suppose that a thousand years is really like one day with God. So if we take that total, if we convert that total life of 78.06 years in that frame of a thousand years being as one day, our life is equal to an hour and 52 minutes. An hour and 52 minutes. So we can see the reality that Peter is saying in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 when he says, For our light and momentary troubles, we are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is not seen. Because what's seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. All through, the, all through the Old Testament, we see that the Bible talks about hardships and trials and all of these things that happen in the light of heaven and in the light of the vision of heaven that's there. And I think that it's Satan's job to keep us going so that we, we keep so focused on what is here in this world now. I've got to go to the doctor next week. I've got to do this next week. I don't know what I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. And when we look at it as an hour of 52 minutes of, of life, we think about all of the joys that we have had in an hour and 52 minutes. We think about the troubles and trials that we've had in an hour and 52 minutes. But when it's compared to eternity, how can you compare an eternity, an hour and 52 minutes to an eternity with God? We cannot do it. But we, and it's easy to begin to think that life stinks and, and then after that death comes. But Peter wrote in the letter, in this letter that, that we have so much more to lift our vision. And he says in Colossians 3, 1, since you've been raised to new life in Christ, set your sights on the reality of heaven. That word set there means to search or focus or be single-minded. Not only is it that, he said, set your sights on, on, on the realities of heaven. That's Colossians 1. <clears throat> but he said set, that, and that word set means to, to make it set, you know, to focus, to be not be double-minded on that. And, and, it, and it also is in the present tense when he said that. So we must keep on seeking and setting our things on things above. 
I like to read several quotes from C.S. Lewis. I've got one here. That I just thought about it all week long. It says, since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, they have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Think about it. We have become so ineffective because we are looking so much at this world that we have. A church sign said, Honk if you love Jesus. Text while you're driving if you want to meet him now. <laughs> And we laugh about that. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating texting while driving, but, you know, a lot of times when we, we as Christians, <clears throat> we almost look at seeing Jesus as being a bad thing. Going and seeing Jesus being a bad thing. It is, it's, it's almost like, you know, what, what was, the, and this was so far away from the reality of the, of the early church. The, the early church it was, they talked about this because, Terry, they were going through things that, I mean, the torture and things that they were going through. How many people do you think were praying for, for to go and go, go to heaven and stuff in the death camps, when, when the Nazi death camps and, and the extermination camps? The, they, they were, I, th I think they were getting to pray together and praying, God, you know, take me home, you know, uh, you know. There's got to be more than this. It, this, this there's more than this is that there is here to this. But the early church did that. You know, so, some of your old songs that we used to, you know, was, used to sing when we were little. You know, swing low, sweet chariot, uh, crossing over Jordan. I'm gonna lay down my battles down by the riverside. A, a lot of these were black spirituals that, that came when, when slavery was there. And the, these people were suffering from injustice. They were suffering from people. And, 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 and they, they, were, they were suffering. So they sang these songs all the time because they knew that there was something beyond what they were facing at this time. And, and, and we as Christians today, we, we, we should be singing. We should be praying. God, there's more to this life than just this. What, what, what do we really see as Christians? What do we really see for, as Christians today? Do, do you really, are, can you really see the shore today? Or is there all, all that you see is just the fog? And it's easy for us to do that. Just this week, Paula had to remind me, she didn't know she was reminding me, but you're looking at the fog. You're not looking for the shore. If we can get this concept in our hearts today, that we have a living hope today, I think God will give us peace over a lot of situations that, that we are looking for. Randy Alcorn, in a book that he wrote, said, we, in, we will enjoy the magnificence, magnificence of our God in, the, in heaven, not merely in spite of what we have suffered, but we will enjoy it more because of what we have suffered. You know, I, I, was, I was talking to Paul about this just this week as well. I said, it seems so unfair what's taken place this year with some of our some of our people, I, I was thinking about David and Diane and the work they have done with the youth and stuff like that, and then all this come up with Diane and stuff. I said, it, you know, it's, it's so it's so unfair. I mean, we look at all of these things, and you take a Greg Worthington, and you take a, and I can just go on and on. I'm not going to name all these, but you think, God, this this is so unfair. Without an eternal perspective. We assume that people die young, with disabilities, with poor health, homeless, maybe never finding the love of their life, couples that never uh, are able to have children. And, and we say, you know what? They missed out on the best that life has to offer. You know, they died so young, they missed out on the best that life has to offer. But what about the hour and 52 minutes? that we were talking about earlier. 
And really, that's flawed theology, and I just saw that this week. Because we say that if they missed out on the best that life has to offer, we're saying really to ourselves as Christians, this life is the best that we have, to, that we'll ever have. And that's not true. Amen. No, that's not true. You know, Paul, Paul said, Paul said, to live is gain, to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He said, I, 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 would, I, I know that it's expedient that I live with you and, and that I'm here with you. But he says, my desire is to die and go see Jesus. I want to go see Jesus. What, what, did, was he depressed? Or what was he... <clears throat> What, what, what was he looking at? He realized his focus was on so much more. He was taking the focus off of the hour and 52 minutes and, and looking at heaven. That was, and, and he was taking his eye focus off the temporary home and looking at the eternal home and saying it was so much better. He has, we has, haven't missed out any at all. C.S. Lewis, and I'm going to let you go. I've got one, one more quote here for you. Some say that temporal suffering, there is no future bliss that can make up for it. Not knowing that heaven once obtained will work backwards and turn the agony into a glory. But, uh, let me, what he's saying is that, you know, Saying that there's no, there's no, there's no blessing, there's no bliss that can ever make up for what we suffer in agony. But what he's saying is, once we get to heaven, God will make the things that went forward go backward, and He's going to actually turn our agony into a glory. I think as soon as Paul's head left the chopping block, he was shouting the streets of glory. I, I don't think since, and this is my opinion, I don't think since Paul's got to heaven, talking about the Apostle Paul, one time did he bring up about the whipping or the shipwreck or the beatings. Or anything, when he looked at Jesus Christ and saw what he went through, I, I think he forgot all of that. It's almost like a woman that has a baby. It's, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's extreme pain. I've had kidney stones. They say it's kind of like a woman having a baby, but uh, I've had kidney stones. But, you know, almost everybody you talk to, women, of course. <coughs> Say that once they have that baby, give them a few months to kind of get over the C-section or, you know, having the baby and the soreness and stuff. They really don't remember the pain anymore. Not in the, not in the specifics because they've got something. It, that they've got a joy. That, that agony has been turned into a glory for them. And so they forget all of those things. Life on this planet is broken. It's broken. <laughs> It is not going to be set straight until the book of Revelation when God comes back for his children and takes the curse off of this world, remakes it new again that we'll ever have that world like it was in the Garden of Eden where there'll be no more tears, no more, no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more heartache. But that's eternity we're talking about. We're not talking about our hour and 52 minutes that we live in this world today and what God sees. I haven't reached that point yet. <clears throat> I will admit there are days that, that I still look and I see nothing but the fog. But Billy, I've been praying this week. Help me see Sean. Help me see shore. I want to look past the fog and see the shore. I'm afraid there's going to be some people when they get to heaven, they may make it to heaven. Oh, how much more they would have had in, 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 
in rewards and things like this, I'm sure there's going to be people that say, if I could have just seen the shoulder, I would have kept on going. I would have kept on doing what I should have been doing. As you leave this morning, let's fix our eyes daily on our devotions. Fix our eyes daily on, on, on the eternal things. We don't know what 2021 is going to bring. I pray to God it's not like 2020. <laughs> but if it is worse, God's going to be with us. God, God's going to be with us. Because we've read the last chapter of the book and you know what? Say that with me. We win. Say it one more time. We win. One more time. We win. Book of Revelation. We win. We've read if we can see that, we see the end of the book and we see the shore and we know that we win. God is still on the throne today. Let, let God flood your heart with hope this week as we go into Thanksgiving week and say, God, I know you got me no matter what takes place. I'm praying for healing. I'm praying for this, but I know you got me. And see what God will do if we can change our perspective and focus on that. God, we just thank you today, God, for this word. Lord, we can have an unshakable hope. I pray that for myself, God, you would give me that for unshakable hope. Lord, that I would focus on the things of heaven, the eternal things. Help me to realize I'm living in the hour and 52 minute, minute time of my life. I may be in an hour and 50 minutes right now. But God, you know, God, that, Lord, you are coming soon. We know what shape the world's in. We know the world is broken. But we trust you, O oh God, to give us that unshakable hope, knowing, O oh God, that all of these things that are taking place are just a little while. These trials, these tribulations, and we're going to see you and live forever with you. We thank you, Lord, as we go into your house to worship, Lord, and, and praise you in the sanctuary. Lord, let us be mindful of all that you've done for us. For your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate you being here this morning. Good class.